Hey y'all, it is Ken and we are climbing the labyrinth. This is episode five, six, episode six, I think. Um, and we are going to dive in, hopefully in a quick way, um, but thorough, to some of the ARC documentation that has been put out on their website. So ARC, Association of, excuse me, Alliance, not Association, Alliance of Reformed Churches, uh, and this is kind of the the probable direction that many are looking at. Um, those that are looking at leaving the RCA are looking towards the ARC. Um, and what may be helpful, if you haven't, up here I will put some info of previous videos that I've done. I've done some uh, podcasts on um, why we're looking at leaving the RCA, um, a couple other ones of things that are going on in the RCA that maybe we don't, um, that we're not all savvy to, some some things that happen in the East Coast churches um, that may cause us in the, the more um, traditional or conservative viewpoint to go, I don't know that that's okay. And then uh, one that was recent regarding some Ash Wednesday emails and some Zoom call stuff on the RCA Facebook page. But I'll link those up top here. You'll see little bubbles that come up, and you can you can click on those if you want. But today, what we're going to do is jump into this ARC stuff. So I'm going to bring up right here the the Alliance of of um, Reformed Churches website. Uh, you can go to allianceofreformedchurches.org, or I believe you can go to ARC twenty one, as in as in the year right now twenty one. Dot org, and I'm just on the home page here. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see some things. That's as big as I can zoom it. Um, and so as we move down, the the first thing to highlight is they they put out three tenets, three things off the very beginning that kind of drive some of the the things and the decisions moving forward. The first one is uh, Reformed theology provides the clearest, most hopeful, most biblical, authentic expression of Christian belief and witness. We are eager to lead in a renewed emphasis upon its core principles and expressions of good news to the world. Now, so the first thing is, is that we will be Reformed. I mean, that's kind of said in the name, um, but that we will hold those things close. And, and they kind of give a little excerpt on things within the God's image bearers and priesthood of believers and classic creedal statements and confessions that you can go and kind of take a peek at. The second one in the middle there is local church. The local church is God's primary instrument for ministry and outreach. Our agenda seeks to empower congregations of men, women, and children to practice and proclaim God's redeeming work in the world. Now, here, the big priority is that they want things to be local-oriented, not, not grand scheme of the, the general assembly of people coming together in the denomination is the big thing. The big thing is, is you locally in your church and the ministry that you're doing. Uh, it even says further down um, that leadership training is essential and that planting new churches is a top priority in our budget, that that providing churches with what they need and establishing discipleship pathways and stuff and helping congregations do that is going to be important. Uh, and the third tenet that they kind of highlight there is that polity must serve to enhance the work described above without becoming rigid or complex. We celebrate a system of accountability and resource sharing that is agile and innovative in anticipation of new and fruitful ministry. So that within, um, like right now, what we have within our own polity of the RCA is things are, are pretty top heavy as far as dollars and cents that go out, I think within the Dakota classes budget, uh, this is just off the top of my head, I think maybe 50 of the $115 between, um, per member assessment between um, General Synod, Regional Synod, and Classis, 50 of that, $50-ish, goes towards General Synod. And then um, the two other 30s are kind of broken down between Regional Synod and uh, the local Classis. 
and and the struggle there is is within the polity is you send a lot of money away and you can't really do anything about it. So if you don't like the things that the the general senate is saying as far as just the employees and stuff, uh, well you can't do a whole lot about that unless you're on the general senate council, or um, the struggle between classes being able to bring charges or discipline or even just question, you know, hey, why are you allowing this to happen within your classes is still a struggle. And so I, I think that's part of what they're they're getting at here. What I want to do now is I'm going to scroll back up to the very top of their website and we were under the home tab. I'm going to go to the organization tab. And when you click on the organization tab, it pops up this PDF. I got one that I already wrote all over here. Um, that gives you the Alliance of Reformed Churches organizational conviction. So let's go through this real quick. The introduction here um, gives you a little bit of preamble-ish sort of stuff, but this is just my interpretation. I'll say right off the bat, I am not a part of any of the meetings that are establishing any of these guidelines, any of these uh, convictions. I am just hearing things and interpreting things based on what I read. So I read through this, made some highlights and circled some things, and then I'm just going to tell you what I think about it, because these are some of the things that you as a leader within the church, uh, especially an RCA church or a church that's looking towards the ARC, may be wondering. Um, so this may be beneficial for um, ministers that don't have time to kind of sift through all this stuff, or specifically elders, deacons, and other uh, members in the congregation that are interested. So the introductory convictions, uh, denominations and other multi-congregational systems are tools given to the church by the spirit for the good of the kingdom. And then it introduced some other things. And the next line is really important too. They are not, however, biblically mandated. And so what they're saying from the very beginning is that denominations, all of these different possible structures are there that are given to the church to help them not mandated that the Bible says you have to have these. So they don't want to start out the ARC by saying, thou shalt be in the ARC because it's better for all of us. It is good to be aligned together and to be able to accomplish mission and ministry together and and pool resources. Uh, But what they are saying immediately is that those aren't essential. Those are not mandated that you have to, uh, but we're here for the benefit of each other. Scroll down just a little bit more. Um, With these things in mind, they have a couple of questions that they pose at the beginning. What role should an organization of churches serve? Uh, What theology, history, polity, or calling should unite them? And how does covenant, a beer, a a clear, (laughs) not a beer, (laughs) a clear biblical value, inform relationships among churches? So I think they're going to flesh some of these things out as we move through. The first thing here they have is relational convictions. Let's take a peek here. So relational convictions, the first one they have here is, we are friends and partners in Christ. Uh, Unity in Jesus, our only hope for salvation, you should hear some Heidelberg catechism in there, implies praying for one another, celebrating together, encouraging one another, and here's the big one, and holding each other accountable. Unity in Jesus is all of these things. Unity uh, does hold within it what the RCA used to call discipline, the aspect to say, hey, in order to be a part of us, these are the things that we hold dear, Uh, things that were very common within the early church. You can look through the epistles of John and find the struggle between things that are and are not allowed within the body of believers, uh, and some of the, the context within Paul and the Corinthian church. But the thing that they're they're pointing out here is holding each other accountable, or at least that's what I'm reading, that that's important as we begin our relational convictions, inviting each other into the, each other's kitchen to say, hey, we've noticed this. Um, and that may seem like a scary thing, but in the end, it is beneficial. We are unrelenting, unrelentingly innovative. In order to remain relevant and engaged within a changing world, we will practice active listening, careful discernment, global attentiveness, and confident creativity in our lives and ministry. We're, we're not going to be stuck where we were. We're not going to live in nostalgia is how I read that. The next one is a little bit goofy. Well, let's look at this. We embrace the diversity of human experience. Now, anytime I hear that, I go, whoa, um, 
we embrace human experience and that there's a diversity in that. The next line is really important. Under obedience to Christ as our king. So under the obedience of Christ, then we embrace the diversity of human experience, that Christ is the one that sheds light on all things, not our experience shedding light on what Christ is doing. This is vitally important. Um, And then underneath it, in doing so, we respond with compassion to the oppressed, we lead with justice in the face of injustice, and we seek in all situations to live out the presence of Christ in the presence of Christ in people's lives. Now, I put a little thing over here, a VS, that, that either this is a um, denominational virtue signaling, trying to say the right things to make the right people happy, um, or this is really them making a statement that under Christ's obedience, then you find true justice, then you find true compassion, then you find actually people's lives that are being shaped there. Like, I, I, I tend to think that that's that way, um, but something a little further on as we move down makes me go, well, maybe somebody is just looking for some statements. Uh, let's jump into the theological convictions. So the next thing they have here is theological convictions. This is that that idea of renewing uh, reform theology, one of the tenets that we looked at at the beginning of the website. Biblical authority and understanding. Anybody that's been in the RCA for a while knows that this is a hot button. This is a topic that really pokes. And so the first dot they have here, the first bullet is we affirm the Bible as the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God. I think we've all kind of lived in that place and, and would agree to that. The next one is we affirm we are living within God's redemptive historical story. Now, I have that underlined because what they're saying is that God has been at work throughout the history of the world of his people through Israel, through the church, even up into today. I mean, um, the basic tenet of progressive revelation that God continues to reveal himself throughout the scriptures, but then also the idea that within the historical story of the church, that God has been working his way through redemption. And now, um, from the liberal side, you could look at that and say, well, then he's deciding to change things when it regards to sexuality and some of that. And and I don't think that's what they're saying. I think, I think what they're saying is we hold true to the tra- tradition and to the historical story that God has revealed to us in his plan of redemption. Um, that is constructed and governed by God's covenants and promises. Yes. Okay, the next one. We affirm that understanding the Bible correctly requires use of consistent exegetical principles that include, now for those of you that are kind of in the lay world, exegetical principles means things that you take out from the text. The principles that you use, these are the the uh, the glasses that you put on when you approach the scripture. Um, some people would, would put on the, the glasses of looking for oppression. Some people would put on the glasses of looking for liberation. Some people would put on the glasses of looking for um, feminist theologies, and this is what we do as theologians, as pastors, we all have our own things, but what they're saying right off the bat is there are principles that are important and acknowledge them as as exegetical and not just reading into things. And those include grammatical, literary, historical, language, and theological dimensions that, that I think they will flesh that out further uh, as, as they get in, into more documentations. Uh, We affirm the illumination of the Holy Spirit, uh, the author who sits with us every time we open his best-selling book. Now, (laughs) this is just funny to me. Like, this is, if you've been in most Reformed churches, you usually hear a prayer of illumination before there's the reading of the scripture or the the sermon asking God to speak, that the Spirit would would bring the words um, beyond just words on a page. Uh, or if you're more Bardian, that you would actually ask God to make your words his words or that his words would be yours and that um, when, the, when the word is preached, when the scriptures are preached, then, then God's spirit works through that in a, in a deeply theological, profound way. The funny part in here is that they had to add best-selling book. Like, <laughs> that's just one of those things. I, I probably wouldn't put that in there if I was an editor kind of sculpting this. It's kind of cheesy to me, but hey, it's not that it's untrue. The next thing is reform confessional theology. 
couple of bullets here. We affirm the Apostles' Creed, Athanasian, Nicene, and as members of the global church. Like, this is something that we've had in the RCA for a long time, and many, many, many churches do this. You may not find this in more free or Baptist-oriented churches where they ascribe to no creed but Christ, um, but most mainline or most evangelical churches are, are pretty okay with this. The next one is because their doctrines align with our understandings of God's Word. So because this is the way we understand God's Word, we're okay with the next things. We affirm the Heidelberg Catechism, which is no surprise to many, the Belgic Confession, which is no surprise to many, the Canons of Dort, which is sort of a surprise to some, but not historically a surprise. I mean, honestly, if you really push most of our ministers and our congregant members, my hunch is most don't ascribe to the full points of the Canons of Dort. And, and some of that is the struggle is it was written for a specific purpose at a specific time. Um, and that's maybe a topic for another day. But I don't know that everybody would say that they're down with the Canons of Dort fully. Uh, we just have for many, many years, even though many don't ascribe to them theologically. Uh, the one that may, su may surprise you is, and the Westminster Confession. We, we affirm these as historic, reformed expressions of Christian faith. Now, most of us that didn't grow up, if you didn't grow up Presbyterian, you don't know what the Westminster Confession is. It's, a, it's one of the confessions within the Presbyterian churches, and really, I mean, Presbyterian and Reformed are just offshoot branches based on different areas in which they kind of came to life. I, I can't give you a whole lot of insight into the Westminster Confession. I haven't read it probably ever. Bits and pieces in seminary, but I am not familiar enough with it to kind of say anything one way or the other. I'm going to assume that it falls in line with the others, although I may have to do some reading on that and then bring some issue or some, uh, not issue, but a podcast about that later. It goes on. We utilize these confessions to help us understand the Bible, direct the way we live in response to the gospel, and to locate us within the larger body of Christ. So we use these things, these confessions, to shape who we are as a people, as God's church. Not saying that we elevate them over Scripture, but that they are the things that help us to interpret Scripture. These are the things that, that point back to God's redemptive story that he's worked throughout the church, and the church said, these are important, so how can we, how can we um, pass these on? And I mean, like the Heidelberg Catechism, this was written for kids so that they could actually get some, some biblical learning. And if you go through it, it's, it's question and answers. But the reality is, is almost every answer has, has double digit number of scripture references behind it. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Uh, they also, we affirm the Great Lakes Catechism on marriage and sexuality as a confessional, now this is important, as a confessional appendix to the Heidelberg Catechism so that its affirmations regarding human sexuality are read within the context of the Heidelberg Catechism's teaching on sin, salvation, and service. So this would be kind of the addendum, the thing that you'd stick along the back of saying, you know, this wasn't an issue during the time of Heidelberg, but it's an issue for us today. And if you haven't read it, you can find that online, um, but it is, it's very good from the crew out of the Great Lakes. And this, this gives us more info um, to help with kids and, and really anybody in our churches that are really struggling and asking the question of why do we believe what we believe regarding human sexuality? Um, and that it's not on its own, that it stands within continuity of the Heidelberg Catechism. The next thing you get here is we affirm the local option. This is very important. The local option for congregations to affirm the Belhar Confession. Now, the Belhar Confession, for those of you that aren't savvy, comes from South Africa and is a product of the struggle with apartheid. The RCA chose to bring that on board um, within the last five, five or six years or so. It's been talked about for a while. Um, and it was a point of contention for many. Uh, but what they do here is they say it's a local option that you as a church can choose to, to affirm that, but as an appendix to the Belgic Confession, so that its affirmations of unity, justice, and equality are read within the context of the Bel Belgic Confession's view of humanity, Scripture, and God's work. So this is the same deal that they did with Heidelberg for the Great Lakes Confession. 
or the Great Lakes Catechism, excuse me. What they're saying here for the Belhar that that when read within the context of the Belgic Confession, the one that has been in long standing, then there are things that you can affirm in that, but it doesn't doesn't just stand out on its own, and it's also a local option. And then the last one here, we affirm the future confessional states. We affirm that future confessional statements may be adopted as confessional addendums to the Heidelberg Catechism or the Belgic or Westminster Confessions. So here what they're saying is, you know, this isn't the very end. There may be something else that comes along. And this is kind of the main tenet or one of the the big tenets of the Reformation, not like our Reformation within the RCA, but the Reformation of Reformed and Always Reforming, trying to always say, God, what is it that you're trying to teach us now? Uh, So they're leaving the door open for other things. Let's keep going. The church. Next topic, the church. We affirm that the church is a sent people. Super duper underline. You will see this throughout. A sent people founded and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Next one. We affirm that the church is the heart of God's mission for the world. We affirm that as a sent community, the church is called to multiply From the earliest days of the Christian founding, groups of believers were sent out planters, groups of believers sent out planters to establish new communities of Christian faith uh, where people's lives are transformed by the gospel. We affirm that the mission of multiplication as a core mission of every church and will prioritize our resources to continue planting new communities of Christian faith in our generation. What you should hear here is that the the church is not just a idle place that you go to, that, that there is the true idea that the church is the sent people, the people of God that are called out from their everyday ordinary lives into a kingdom reality, and that kingdom reality looks to be an exponential multiplying factor of how does Jesus, who said, I send you out two by two, really mean that two by two, the world itself will be changed? How do we embrace that reality is the thing that they believe the church is. How do we live into the multiplying factor of our faith? This is evangelism. This is church planting. This is discipleship. um, All of these things woven into the fabric of what the ARC is. So, One of the main tenets of the ARC is that we need to be about the work of the gospel and not just say we're about the work of the gospel. Okay, moving on. Personal spiritual maturity. We affirm the call of every relationship, person, and leader is to live as a spirit-filled Christian who is growing in spiritual maturity, becoming more like Christ every day. We affirm that people should be in this path of discipleship, becoming more and more like Jesus. We affirm that our primary family of faith is not our family of origin, but rather the body of Christ within whom we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And it goes on to quote Ephesians 2, 2.19 through 21. Uh, the, the thing that they're trying to say here is is many of us can look at our own families and just say that that's the only family we have and trying to broaden the scope uh, and say that the church truly is the family of God, that as we come together, we come together to to grow and become more like Christ, and all of these things are interconnected. How do we affirm our theological stances? By being in community with each other. How do we, how do we look towards discipleship that is a sent ministry, multiplying churches and relationships? That's when we have a home base to work from, that we have these relationships where all of us are trying to be more like Jesus day after day. Okay, structural convictions. This is another big one that many of you um, within the RCA and your classes stuff are really going to be wondering. So right off the bat, it says congregational authority. An organization of churches exists to encourage, equip, and empower the local congregation. So it is it is for this. The ARC is for the local church. The the local church is not for the ARC. The ARC says we are here to help you. And and this is how every denomination starts, I think. Uh, but I think they're really really trying to point this out in a good way. And to that end, an organization of churches should always be working in a way that develops healthier missional congregations. 
limits its own ministry reach and steps in only when there is no local option. So what they are explicit about saying here is we are here to help you. We are help we are here the ARC in general, the denomination or association or whatever it officially becomes, a federation doesn't matter. We are here to help you the local church be your best church, be your best self within your context. We are here and we will limit our own scope and reach. This means dollars and cents too, so that you can do things locally. And where you can't do things locally and need help, we will help you. Uh, the next next bullet here is really important for, for those of you that are asking the big question as you're going to leave. The, the ARC right off the bat says, congregations will have full ownership and authority over their local property with the single exception of if a congregation closes, the future use of the property and its assets revert to the organization. Reality is, is all of this is the same as what you would see within your own classes or the Book of Church Order if you're in an RCA church now, uh, but it's just a bit more explicit. So that here, the church owns it all. It's not the classes, it's not the synod, it's not the regional synod that have any sort of say in it, other than if a church closes, then it doesn't just get to go to one of the families. Then the ARC or within its polity structure, there will probably be classes within this, will then help use those things or help allocate those resources moving forward in mission to equip other churches in the area would be my guess. Okay, the next bullet. Core belief in the organization is that men and women are created in God's image and are gifted by the Spirit to equip and lead God's people for ministry. We also maintain that there are two theologically acceptable positions regarding the interpretation of ordained offices. So here we're getting at a really big button for some people that have been around the RCA for quite a while. Uh, I'll, I'll keep reading and then explain it. One position ordains women into ordained offices of the church. The other limits the ordained offices in which women can serve. We respect each other and each other's congregational choices regarding the nature of ordained leadership. This used to be within the RCA Book of Church Order, used to be the conscience clause. This is very similar to that and maybe with some slight adjustments, but basically saying you choose at your church. You choose at your church. So the the struggle that was before the sexuality issue um, within the RCA was women's ministry and whether you would ordain women to the office of elder, deacon, and minister of word and sacrament. And some would say, yep, all of them, and some would say not all of them. What this is saying is you can choose at your church because the reality is, is you do this anyway. Telling somebody that you can or can't hasn't really changed a lot within most of the RCA. Each church kind of makes this choice on its own, and they are writing that out explicitly within the documentation. Moving on a little further, here we get to theological education and pastoral accountability. So for some of you pastors, you may be wondering these questions. We are committed to theological education that is biblical, reformed, and develops leaders who will equip God's people for works of service to, so that they may build up the body of Christ. This is Ephesians 4. Uh, the next bullet here is a big one. The credentials, the reverendness, basically, of congregational, specialized pastors, commissioned pastors, teaching elders will be granted, held, and supervised by a single ordained ministry oversight board for the purpose of professional theological accountability. So if you came from the the Reformed Church over the last uh, 10, 15 years, 20 years, um, before that it had a different name, but there's, there's the MFCA, and then there are the two seminaries, and each would give you a certificate of fitness for ministry. Now the struggle would be is you are ultimately ordained within ministry by the classes, and there's a list of things that each classes has to do um, to see whether you're fit based on after getting the fitness for ministry from either the MFCA, uh, Western, or New Brunswick. MFCA is for the churches or the people that don't go to RCA-sponsored seminaries. They don't go to Western or New Brunswick. I'm not sure that anybody really goes to New Brunswick anymore that's in the RCA anyway. Um, but the point they're making here is there, are, there were individuals that 
were not given a certificate of fitness for ministry from the MFCA, but were then still ordained by their classes, uh, by their classes that that basically jumped a hoop and said, well, we get to ordain them whether you want us to or not. And the MFCA said, we don't find them fit for ministry based on whatever the issues were. Some of those were sexuality issues that were hot button topics, and they chose to make a statement within that classes. So what the what the ARC is saying is there will be one group that decides those things, one board, and they'll they'll one ministry oversight board. They'll flesh this out further, but to avoid the struggle of one thing saying yes, another thing saying no, and then in the end a class is just does whatever they want. The next bullet here is people who hold ordination will hold personal membership in a local congregation for the purpose of personal spiritual accountability. This is very practical that when you are the the person that is ordained and you're at a congregation being a part of the congregation and this is a a pragmatic way of saying hey you are already doing this we'll just explicitly write it out. Okay, moving on. We're getting a little long. We're at 30 minutes already. Missional partnerships. We are committed to the local congregations being the primary place to enhance and grow missional effectiveness through local congregational partnerships and relationships. We want, the ARC wants, local congregations to choose who they want to do partnering with, whether this be um, mission agencies, whether this be staying tied to your your old uh, missionaries from uh, the RCA or other things, just explicitly saying we, we're committed to local congregations being the primary place where this stuff happens. This requires that the organization to equip, empower, and encourage congregations to find and develop healthy partnerships with ministry. So this is the ARC saying, what we will do is try and help you find those relationships if you need help in that. There are some seasons when congregations can be strengthened, utilizing external trainers and coaches. The organization, as in the ARC, will develop transitional pastors, conflict resolution specialists, vocational coaches, and other ministry resource providers uh, whose core outcome is to increase missional effectiveness in congregations. This is, we want to help you do your thing. We want to help you be more missional in your context and in your partnerships. And if you need us, we will try and do our best to have people that help with conflict resolution, transitional ministry, vocational stuff, that, that we will be a resource of, of people rather than a place that holds all the cards. You, you do your thing and we will help you along the way is the way that I read this. Uh, we're getting towards the very end. Okay, last two things. Safe congregations. I got a big circle around this, and I'll read it, and then we'll talk about it for a second. We are committed to carrying out congregationally-based ministry in the context of emotional and physical safety. Congregations of the organization are accountable for utilizing training policies and safety procedures that will ensure safe ministry for all. I'll put a big question mark and a VS on the side of this. Is this is this is one of those virtue signal things that makes my brain go, did somebody poke at a button that we really got to say? Like, what if that needs to explicitly be said? Unless it's for some sort of insurance purposes, some sort of liability thing. Who who doesn't do ministry? Um, within these contexts? Is there anybody that's doing ministry that goes, well, I don't really care about your emotional or physical safety? Now, physical safety, absolutely. Emotional safety, some of that is, that's pretty sketchy grounds of what does emotional safety mean? If you say words I don't like, am I emotionally hurt by them? And so then I'm no longer feeling safe. Some of this stuff, I, I need to see more info on that because that that just feels to me like a, well, let's put this blanket statement in there so that we can appease a specific group of people. Hopefully there's more info on that. And we get to the very last thing, organizational limits. Guiding principles will be established for the organization, the ARC, but the guiding principles will not be elevated to a standard of belief. So the principles that we do things are not more important more important than the beliefs that we have. This is really good right there. That that you're not going to take the the organizational principles that we have and elevate them above above our beliefs. 
organizational funding. This this for you deacons and treasurers, you may like this. Organizational funding will be limited to the need or needed, whatever is needed for organizational leadership and for governing. The organization will intentionally limit its funding to those ministries initiated, identified for partnership, support, and conversation with local congregations. So what they're saying off the bat is people um, that are wanting to be a part of the ARC, that if you come into the ARC, your assessment dollars, you're still going to have them to be a part of something. But when you're a part of that, then those aren't going to go towards a whole bunch of fluff. Those aren't going to go towards another dialogue, another discussion, another Vision 2020 team, a Jerusalem council. A, I mean, you, just, you can just count the hundreds of thousands of dollars the RCA has squandered over dialogues. Um, and what they're saying here is we're going to limit the dollars that we ask – and, and the only things that we're asking is dollars to help you. And we're going to limit those to organizational leadership and governing. So the things that we must do in order to keep us all moving in the same direction, those are the only things that we want to do. We want to keep the dollars staying put at your churches. So the, the, the tithes and offerings and gifts that go to your church, we want them to stay there as much as possible and not be allocated towards the denomination at large any more than is necessary. This is really, really good. Really good. Uh, and then the next line, which I don't fully understand. The organization will provide added value to congregational scope and scale purchasing along with communication of broader knowledge and information to help with local decision making. I'm not really sure if this is kind of the the old thing within the classes where you had to get approval for an indebtedness so that you didn't go out and buy a whole much more building or land than your congregation can actually afford. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it's something along those lines, but they want to be there to help you in those situations. Maybe this is a partnership continued on with the church growth fund. I, I'm, I'm not really sure, uh, other than they're saying, hey, we want to be here to help. Uh, and that's it. That's We get to the bottom of page three within this um, organizational convictions. All of these can be found at arc21.org or allianceofreformedchurches.org. I know it's really long, but once you type it in once, then it's there forever. Uh, or you can do it in um, the Google machine, or I would suggest maybe DuckDuckGo because the Google machine keeps every bit of your data. Um, but yeah, hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, and then as more stuff comes out, I'll do my best to kind of get those things out. Uh, I think that's it. We have climbed a little further up the labyrinth, and we'll see y'all next time.